decision more than ever because there's a time to grieve, there's a time to wonder, time to be angry and um, disillusioned. And then there's a time to decide to follow Jesus still. Still. When um, I tell you a story that um, is very personal to me because one of my my leadership teachings is overcoming disillusionment. Because unless you're disillusioned, you really can't follow anybody. You can't be married. You can't follow Jesus. And you certainly can't be committed to a church. Because we all have illusions, a, a picture of, of what a Christian would be, or what marriage would be, about what ministry would be. And typically those illusions aren't real. And then you get into reality. And then after reality strikes, you get disillusioned. This isn't what I thought. This isn't what I signed up for. Anybody ever said that? You ever said that to yourself? I didn't sign up for this. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you absolutely signed up for all of this. Well, even what's happened with Dan, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's part of it. All of it is part of it. Well, when you hosted our regional conference a number of years ago, is that about five years ago now? About six years ago? I had stepped off the leadership team. Because I had hit some disillusionment with, with some things. And then I had a couple on my staff have an affair. And I had so proud of, prided myself in working with my team and investing my team. And, um, and I had even brought this couple with me for a trip to, to Grand Junction at one time. And I saw this thing coming. I tried to stop it. I sat these people down. I, didn't, I wasn't an absentee leader. I couldn't stop it. And it happened, and I had to let both of them go. And then we have this conference here in Grand Junction, and I just hated being here because I just felt so, I felt so much shame. I felt so much failure. And I was always the guy on top. I, I'm pretty um, resilient. I grew up pretty, pretty rough, home to home and family to family. And you get resilient, you know. You get some tough skin, but I didn't have it. And I'll, I never forget being here in this in, uh, in this auditorium, uh, when there was a call, I think, of Rich Nathan or one of the guys talked on disillusionment, I said, oh, no. <laughs> and I'm, I, I'm nobody's, I am so disillusioned with my leadership, with God and church and the vineyard, and I'm just, I'm just barely here, and now there's a call for disillusionment, and I used to be the leader of the group that's in the room, and I'm sitting in the back. I don't know what to do with myself. That, uh, except that I found my, I remember I walked up and I just simply acknowledged my disillusionment. It's like, God, I don't know what I believe anymore, what I like anymore. I just, but I, I, I'm still in. Now I know what it is. Now about all, all my pride's gone. All of what I can say that I've done and haven't had this and haven't had, it's all happened under my watch as a leader of leaders. And and it's almost like since that time, God said, well, Rick, now we can, we can do this thing because you're not going to have to protect your reputation because now you don't have one. <laughs> and, and that was real to me. And I even had one of my vineyard pastor friends tell me that, how that I was dealing when I was just whining and complaining. He just said, you know, you just don't like what this, how it reflects on you, do you? That's really the issue. And it's like, how dare you tell me something so true? <laughs> and I knew in a moment it was about me, not about him. So can you view? Question on the table is you're going to give Jesus what he wants. As can you view in your church? And uh, that doesn't, that's no promises about how it's going to go. Who's going to stay? Who's going to leave? Who's going to do what next? No guarantees about anything. But you're the team right now. You're willing to come together and say, God, speak to us, and we'll do whatever you say. Lead us, and we'll go. And we want to give you what you want. It starts personally. And then it, begin, it expands corporately to each of you, okay? So one of the things um, 
I'm trying to think for the right time for questions because since I have been in this a long time, I'd, I'd love to help answer questions to bring you you deeper into this. But um, beforehand, I was going to do this in our small groups, but I think just how we're rolling here, um, I want to do a little different. I want you to think together for, with me for a minute about being a, a, just a church, a biblical church. When you think of what are the values, one of the things Kirk asked me to do is talk about some vineyard values. And I've really been wrestling with some of those things because I've been teaching this at home. I've been doing three weeks series, where do, we, where do we go from here? You kind of have the same thing. In fact, I'm teaching that uh, uh, tonight. Tonight, Saturday? Right, tonight. I'm teaching tonight. <laughs> We've just started Saturday nights. It's funny, Dan came to Fort Collins to see our Saturday night and decided he was going to start a Saturday night. Then he came over here and started Saturday night, and it just went great. And we canceled ours because it failed. So we started up again because we like what you're doing so much. So um, what I just interrupted myself right there. Values. But I think a start. So I've been thinking about this a lot for our church because a lot of people in our vineyard church don't know distinct vineyard values. Uh, because I haven't taught on it in a while. We have a lot of unchurched people, a lot of unchurched people, and people from faraway places don't know what the vineyard's about. So I'm kind of linking on this. And so we titled, Where Do We Go From Here? So that's what I'm going to call my talk here. Where do you? Because in light of uh, Kirk and Jane coming and Dan and Cheryl leaving and under the circumstances, you know, I think it's a great question, isn't it? So where do we go from here? And... Uh, so I've been looking back into the scriptures and thinking about these. So, but I want to start at uh, what we call 40,000 feet, real broad, real, real high up. When you think of the church as a Christian, evangelicals, what's some of our non-negotiable values distinctives? That, uh, and I'll, I'll give you one to get, get us kicked off. When you just think about the elements of our life together that are critical or really important. And I'm not thinking vineyard right now. I'm just thinking... Biblical values and distinctives that need to be a strength in, his, in God's church and in this church. And one, I think, is the most obvious, I'll get you started, is obviously being a biblical church. And I'm going to talk about that tonight. The Bible is our uh, final authority on everything we believe and do, right? That, that would be a hallmark of an evangelical, Bible-believing group of people. Give me some others. And I don't know, maybe we could write these down, but I... Uh, I um, the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, so focus. Uh, can we do that? Maybe we could do that. <coughs> okay, the, uh, so uh, a focus is a, the person of Jesus Christ, the centrality of Christ. Exactly. We said that. His first and family. Okay. <laughs> okay. So... Okay, centrality, that needs to be, that's a non-negotiable. Okay, something else. Yes? Then family. Okay. We care for each other. Oh, okay, care for each other, we call that fellowship. I'm trying to think of broad terms. Community, fellowship. So the Bible, fellowship, Jesus. It's kind of ironic. I, that was one that I, I recently presented to our church again, that, we, we come up with a new mission statement, a very simple one, with to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We want Jesus in that name. Not the Lord or God, although that's great to call him the Lord and God, but we want to be a Jesus church. So, okay. Fellowship. Fellowship and community I would put together. I would put fellowship and community. Um, and I think, uh, would we maybe put small groups on that one? Would they, would, yeah. Maybe put small group. How about put small groups on that slash? So, okay. What what other activities? What what's uh, what's our mandates? Yes. That we would see God in prayer. Okay, prayer. Okay. You bet. Let's put prayer down. Now the, these would basically be the same that. Most people should come up with, but oh, we're doing good. What else? Outreach. Outreach, okay. Stewardship. Outreach, uh, would we put... Uh, uh, 
Okay, I was thinking, I think there's two things. I would put a net, uh, I don't want, let's put another missions, evangelism and missions. I think outreach is, when I think of outreach now, it's like to the poor, and to the hurting, and then there's missions and evangelism. Now, do you think evangelism is a mandate? Yeah. Is that negotiable? Yeah. Does the church have any right to renegotiate that piece? A lot of churches do. They don't talk about it like that, but they have renegotiated as a great suggestion more than the Great Commission. Worship. Worship. Okay. Okay, worship. Um, okay. Stewardship. Culturally relevant. Holy Spirit activated. Say, can we say ministry of the Holy Spirit? As we want to have a big, so ministry of the Holy Spirit. People have different takes on what that would look like, right? And then what that would mean. Okay, could we call that equipping, making disciples and equipping? Relational, I would put that in community, in small groups, but I'm, because I want to take a turn here and think and go, you know, where we go a little deeper. I, let's see. I think um, I think somebody said stewardship, giving. Yeah. Okay. As a pastor, we don't want to let that not get up there. I want to make sure those always hit the list. Kirk, have you started? Have you started dialoguing with the, the simple church concepts at all yet? Okay. Now, most, and I'm thinking about this strong biblical mandates, you know, uh, uh, that are there. Now, so we've got uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Now, we've been realizing that when we think about our distinctives, that when there's that many, it's hard to remember any of them. And one of the, maybe an exercise to do, I don't know if it's for now, is to break those up in, into maybe four or five. See, we've had those traditionally in the vineyard. But to put those under some headings that become those clear distinctives. You know, and I think those are biblically driven values for every church. For every church. Um, uh, with, you know, I think prayer, you could put, you know, the outreach and missions together, obviously, and you can put the uh, prayer and worship and, uh, and those kinds of things. So I think that those are, but that to me doesn't necessarily distinguish the vineyard. That could be a lot of churches. Do you agree with that? Yeah. That could be a lot. Yes. What's that? Okay. But that's, Jesus said, you know, I didn't come to here, you know, for those that are well, those, but those that are sick. Okay, now we're switching gears. It's interesting. Now you're starting to think differently. You're moving. You're now starting to think, what, is, what, is, what distinguishes us? See, I, I think starting point is, what is the broad mandates of Scripture to the church? That, then the second Piece is how does God want us to carry out those and express those, those kinds of things, okay? And so uh, one exercise is to bring those, but let's go ahead. You, anybody wrote the, write those things down? Yeah. Kirk, you have those? Anybody? Is anybody? Somebody's got them? Okay. Okay, so let's, let's, let's turn a corner and go around this way. I want to give you... Um, um, three, I want to give you about eight distinctives. 
but that has to be first because, you know, when I, when I was thinking about teaching our church about the vineyard and who we are as a church, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to just try to orient a vineyard kind of thing. I want to be a biblical church. I want, I want to be a church that comes out of the, out of the scriptures and, and not feel bad about that, not to start with how are we different or how are we unique or what are our nuances. I want to make sure that we encompass you know, all the realities of, of, of Jesus' church and the church that Jesus would build and start there. And uh, so I've come up with about eight things that, and you might have some more, when I think as a vineyard leader that are distinguishing elements of us as the vineyard. And I'm not talking about better or worse, but and some have already been mentioned. I think we all need to be committed to scripture and worship and fellowship and things like small groups and reaching out to the poor and evangelism and, those, and prayer and, and those, those kinds of things. I think those are, are critical elements. But um, the, I think the number one vineyard distinctive is this thing called the kingdom of God. That influence, so the kingdom of God. It's our theology and practice. If you come from a charismatic you know, viewpoint, there's the traditional views about healing and the atonement and how does the gifts of the Holy Spirit, there's classical charismatic, you know, theologies and influence and they tend to just usher themselves right into the vineyard. So for us, our, under, our theological understanding and premise comes out of this thing called the kingdom of God. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is near, is at hand, has come upon you. The kingdom of God is advancing, breaking into our world. The kingdom of God has come, is coming, and will come. You know, it's, and uh, George Eldon Ladd is one of our, kind of the guys that's really expressed that. And there's a number of, of vineyard guys that have written some books. But theologically speaking, what really does separate us from a lot of groups is our commitment to a kingdom of God theology and expression. And that, that reflects, you know, how we believe in, in terms of stepping out to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to break the power of the, of the evil one's stronghold in, people, in people's lives. And, uh, and, and so that's, uh, it's a non-negotiable. It, it is the hallmark undergird of every vineyard church. And, uh, and I'm realizing I've done a lousy job in my church teaching, teaching on that. And now uh, I'm trying to, uh, to do it because it's, we don't have that in our culture where people think in terms of kingdoms and kings and things like that. But to really understand about, about, about Jesus coming and God's purposes and establishing his kingdom. A lot of people thought that he was going to establish a political kingdom. John the Baptist missed it. When he said, did I miss it? Are you the one or should we keep looking? Because you didn't act like the Messiah. Where's this kingdom stuff? You know, we're expecting that we heard about the kingdom of God being established, but it's not come. What is this? But you said it is come. And then Jesus, you go back, tell John what's happening. The deaf hear, the blind eyes are open, captives set free, and basically said, this is what I do. This is the kingdom moving. And so then Jesus says from the time of John the Baptist, so now the kingdom of God has been what? Forcefully advancing. From that time, it's pushing on. But we want it all done. And then we don't, and then, and then we don't understand how it works so that the whole idea of the kingdom it's it's